This figure does a very nice job of summarizing drugs used in peptic ulcer disease. Let's start by reviewing the normal parts of this diagram. Right in the middle, you see the proton pump, which is a hydrogen potassium ATPase. The pump is going to pump hydrogens into the lumen of the stomach and potassium into these parietal cells. Also recognize the three physiologic stimulators for acid production. That would be gastrin, acetylcholine, and histamine. So all three of those receptors immediately become targets for drugs that can be useful in peptic ulcers. You see one receptor, prostaglandin receptors, that inhibits the proton pump. So stimulating that receptor would inhibit the production of acid. You also see a number of other drugs that can work actually in the lumen of the stomach. Let's start with the most popular drugs for peptic ulcer disease. That would be H2 blockers and proton pump inhibitors. Drugs that block the histamine H2 receptor have been very effective for a long time in treating peptic ulcers. Certainly that's going to block one of the three major pathways for acid production. But today, proton pump inhibitors have become even more popular. It's because the proton pump inhibitors have a greater efficacy in stopping acid production. Binding to the proton pump stops all three physiologic pathways. When you look at other options for peptic ulcers, you can certainly discuss the pros and the cons of various drugs. For example, you can use muscarinic blockers to decrease acid production. Blocking the actions of acetylcholine will inhibit the proton pump, but unfortunately, you get a lot of side effects associated with that type of drug, so it's not commonly used. Gastrin receptors are another target, but we don't currently have any medications that specifically block this receptor. With prostaglandin receptors, we can use the drug misoprostol. It's a prostaglandin agonist that will stimulate this receptor to inhibit the actions of the proton pump. In the lumen, we see the site of action for anacids, which very rapidly will neutralize the acid in the stomach. You also have drugs like sucralfate or bismuth, which can coat the surface of the ulcer and aid in the healing of the peptic ulcer. You'll notice I've got a clinical vignette on this slide about Zollinger-Ellison syndrome. Most of you have learned Zollinger-Ellison is a gastrinoma. You get hypersecretion of gastrin. And certainly gastrin all by itself can activate the proton pump. But gastrin can also cause histamine release from enterochromaffin-like cells. So in Zollinger-Ellison, you're actually seeing two pathways to activate the proton pump and increase acid production. If you're going to choose between a histamine H2 blocker and a proton pump inhibitor for Zollinger-Ellison, it's pretty clear the proton pump inhibitor is the better choice. Once again, you should see clearly why blocking the proton pump directly is going to block both of those pathways. Let's start by discussing the histamine H2 antagonist. The prototype of this group is the drug cimetidine, but there are other important members that you should know, ranitidine and famotidine. As we saw in the previous figure, these drugs are going to be competitive inhibitors of the action of histamine on H2 receptors, and they're going to decrease the action of the proton pump. We certainly can use histamine H2 blockers in peptic ulcer disease, in gastroesophageal reflux disease, and we can also consider them in Zollinger-Ellison, though overall they're much less effective than proton pump inhibitors. We didn't talk much yet about GERD in esophageal reflux disease. Today, the most common strategy for treating patients with GERD is to use drugs that stop acid production, and that, of course, would be H2 blockers or proton pump inhibitors. Initially, you can try an H2 blocker, but many patients are going to move on and take a proton pump inhibitor to stop their GERD. When we think of side effects for the H2 blockers, we're mostly focusing on cimetidine. Cimetidine has an anti-androgenic effect. It seems to have an ability to actually block androgen receptors, which can result in gynecomastia and decreased libido. Makes for a good test question. But I think when you think about cimetidine, you're always thinking about its P450 inhibitor effect. It's probably the most classic of the P450 inhibitors with lots and lots of drug interactions. So remember, 
a patient who's on cimetidine is typically going to have elevated levels of other medications in their body, and that could lead to an increased risk of side effects. When we think about proton pump inhibitors, we're aware of how popular these drugs are today. Drugs like omeprazole and other prazoles, you'll notice the common ending for these drugs' name, they're actually irreversible inhibitors. I want you to think about an advantage for these drugs being irreversible. Well, because they're binding irreversibly to the proton pump, they're certainly going to have a long-lasting effect. Most people can take prazoles once a day. If you compare that back to the histamine H2 blockers, those are taken two to four times a day. So it's certainly much more convenient dosing with a PPI. Overall, these drugs are considered more effective than H2 blockers in peptic ulcer disease, in GERD, in Zollinger-Ellison, and they're also useful for eradication of H. pylori. Back in the antimicrobial section, we covered antibiotics that are used for H. pylori eradication. Do you remember the four drugs? We used a mnemonic, which was MCAT. M for metronidazole, C, clarithromycin, A, amoxicillin, and T, tetracycline. Perhaps something that can help you with that mnemonic is that every drug in that mnemonic has a different mechanism of action. It's a way to check and see if you've actually put two drugs from the same category in your mnemonic because that would be a mistake. We typically choose two of those antibiotics, for example, clarithromycin and amoxicillin, and combine them with a proton pump inhibitor, a three-drug regimen for H. pylori eradication. The drug misoprostol is a PGE1 analog. Misoprostol has an ability to actually increase mucus and bicarbonate secretion in addition to decreasing the actions of the proton pump and thereby decreasing acid production. Certainly the drug sounds like a, a good option for peptic ulcer disease, and it was previously used for NSAID-induced ulcers. The use makes sense because patients who are taking NSAIDs have decreased prostaglandin production, and misoprostol has an ability to replace those prostaglandins. Again, sounds like a good idea. The problem with this drug is it's not nearly as effective, even for NSAID-induced ulcers, as proton pump inhibitors. So today, PPIs are more commonly used in the setting of NSAID-induced ulcers. The drug sucralfate is used because it has an ability to coat the surface of the ulcer, protect from further damage, and allow for healing of the ulcer. Here's an interesting property of sucralfate that could show up in a test question. The drug requires an acid pH in order to work. If you're confused right now, you're thinking, I'm going to swallow this drug, right? It's going to go to the stomach, and the stomach is very acidic. That all sounds good, and if you take sucralfate by itself, it certainly is effective. But if you take sucralfate with any of our other peptic ulcer medications, antacids, proton pump inhibitors, H2 blockers, all of those drugs are going to increase the pH of the stomach and make sucralfate much less effective. So the real problem with this drug is you can't take it with other medications, so it's not that popular a choice today. Our next drug is bismuth. This is a drug that's going to also, like sucralfate, bind to the surface of the ulcer, coat it, and protect it from further damage from acid and pepsin. We sometimes see bismuth used as part of an H. pylori eradication mechanism. We combine it with metronidazole and tetracycline in a regimen known as BMT. You might also remember bismuth as the main component of Pepto-Bismol, and perhaps their commercial helps you to remember what this drug does. The commercial tells you the drug coats, it soothes, and it relieves, and that's exactly what bismuth does. If you get a question that asks, what is the most rapid way to relieve the pain associated with peptic ulcers? The answer is take an antacid. And acids have the most rapid onset of any of our medications. So drugs like aluminum hydroxide, magnesium hydroxide, or calcium carbonate. And sometimes we actually combine these in the same product. The antacids are simply going to neutralize protons in the gut lumen. If you take aluminum hydroxide, aluminum has a side effect of causing constipation, whereas magnesium can cause diarrhea.
Certain products have combined both aluminum and magnesium to offset these GI side effects. You certainly have to remember that antacids are going to raise stomach pH, and that can influence certainly the absorption of a number of drugs. There's a note in the margin, a clinical correlate, that reminds us what antacids are going to do to weak acids and weak based drugs. It really takes us back to ionization principles that we reviewed back in our general principles section. If we increase the pH of the stomach, what's going to happen to the absorption rate for a weak base? Well, on my slide, I've included a graph from back on page six, where we were discussing the rate of absorption as well as the rate of elimination over time. This is the graph where we discuss terms like lag time, onset of activity, and duration of action. So if you take an antacid and a weak base drug at the same time, what's going to happen to the rate of absorption of that weak base? With a higher pH in the stomach, the weak base is more likely to be non-ionized. So its absorption rate is going to be increased. Imagine the slope on the left being even steeper than what it is now. That means you're going to reach the MEC even faster than before, which means you shorten the onset of activity. On the other hand, if you take an antacid and a weak acid drug at the same time, with a higher pH, the weak acid is more likely to move into its ionized state. So its absorption is going to be slowed. The graph, the slope on the left, will be depressed. It'll take longer to reach the MEC, so your onset of activity will be increased. A totally different principle is what happens with antacids and tetracyclines or fluoroquinolones. Remember, this is because of chelation. The metals in the antacid bind up the antibiotic, preventing its absorption. Next, we're going to look at the emetic pathways and drugs that can have a very important anti-emetic effect. First, let's start with the receptors that are associated with causing vomiting. There are two receptors on this diagram, the dopamine D2 and the serotonin 5-HT3 receptor that are very popular targets as anti-emetics. Those receptors are found in the chemoreceptor trigger zone, and when they're activated, they cause vomiting. So clearly blocking D2 or blocking 5-HT3 are important anti-emetic strategies. You'll notice also muscarinic M1 receptors found in the emetic center, found in the vomiting center. So blocking muscarinic receptors there has an anti-emetic effect. You also notice the NK1 receptor. This is a receptor for substance P. By blocking this receptor, you can block the actions of substance P, stimulating vomiting. We have one receptor on the diagram that we actually want to stimulate to have an anti-emetic effect, and that's the cannabinoid receptor CB1. If I stimulate CB1, I have an anti-emetic effect. When we look at the serotonin 5-HT3 blockers, we find a family name for these drugs, which is Cetron. Examples would be Ondansetron and Granisetron. These are very popular antiemetics today, including they're used in cancer chemotherapy. We know that a number of our chemotherapy agents are going to cause nausea and vomiting. So these drugs, perhaps along with others, are often used in those patients. The dopamine receptor blockers, prochlorperazine and metaclopramide, are also useful as antiemetics. These are drugs that block the dopamine D2 receptor. You'll notice that I've highlighted the zine part of prochlorperazine. We've covered zines before. Back in our section on antipsychotic drugs, we had a group of drugs called typicals. It was haloperidol and the zines. Prochlorperazine has some weak antipsychotic effects, but it's more commonly used as an antiemetic, but the mechanism is the same. Metaclopramide, a drug known as a prokinetic because it also has the ability to increase GI motility, has been used in GERD, but watch out for the side effect of either of these drugs. Since they work like typical antipsychotics and block the D2 receptor, that can cause movement disorders including pseudo-Parkinson's. So chronic therapy with either of these dopamine receptor blockers, watch out for movement disorders.
The histamine H1 blockers we covered in a previous chapter. If you're a first-generation antihistamine, you have an ability to block muscarinic receptors. That's what diphenhydramine, meclizine, and promethazine all share. And that's the reason why they have an anti-emetic effect. Other anti-emetics include scopolamine, the muscarinic receptor blocker that we see used for motion sickness. The marijuana derivative dronabinol is a cannabinoid agonist. It stimulates CB1 receptors to have its anti-emetic effect. The NK1 receptor blocker is a prepotide. So certainly if we look at these drugs, make sure you know the serotonin 5-HT3 blockers and the dopamine D2 blockers, but we've also covered a few other important antiemetics. In the margin is a clinical correlate about opioids. We've studied earlier that opioids have a direct emetic effect, but also the fact that opioids stop pain, and pain is a stimulus for causing nausea and vomiting. So there's really a dual action for our opioids, directly causing emesis or indirectly by stopping pain, they can have an anti-emetic effect. 